Okay, guys, um, we only have uh, two more days left of this. We're going to do review on Wednesday, and then we'll have a test on the Gilded Progressive Era on Thursday. Then we'll be moving forward into imperialism. So today we're going to be talking about um, the farmers and the growth of some of the uh, now, when we talk about the farmers, we're talking about agrarian. Agrarian from agriculture means relating to farming. Uh, so whenever you hear that, that's vocabulary. Uh, remember we did problems that the cattlemen faced and the homesteaders? These are very similar. Um, this, these are problems that farmers are going to be facing during this era. And, of course, you always have weather. Uh, prairie fires out there on the um, open plains. The railroads are putting it to the farmers. They are um, going into debt because the supply and demand um, is, is not in their favor at this point and shipping costs. And then to top everything out, there is going to be a horrible, horrible uh, insect problem. These are grasshoppers, and in 1874, clouds and clouds and clouds of millions and billions of grasshoppers swept across the Great Plains. And this is called the Great Grasshopper Plague of 1874. You can see here, uh, they were about the size of your hand. They were very large, and they flew <coughs> from place to place, much like a tornado. You can see how they decimated the corn crop here. They ate everything in sight, including... This is showing how it's overwhelmed. There are no pesticides back then, and there was no way for people to, to fight against this plague. So the farmers are suffering, and it's estimated up to 50% of farmers are going to lose their... Lose this man steps up, and he says, you know what we've got to do? We've got to get together, and we've got to form some sort of organization. And um, Oliver Kelly is going to form an organization called the Grange. And the Grange is really a great big barn. And they called it the Grange because that's where they would meet in these big So um, it's also known as the patrons of husbandry. You don't really have to know this, but do know the Grange. Uh, it was a huge political lobby gr uh, group because over 50% of our population were farmers. So what it did is pool their resources. Now, even today, you might see some of these great, big, huge uh, reapers and tractors, um, farmers will build them, uh, buy them cooperatively, and they will share this equipment because the costs are so high. And um, building the mills and so forth, and you still have these cooperatives to this day. They started banks and insurance companies. You might have heard of Farmers Insurance. I'm going to post this link. It's a hip hues video talking about the grain. <clears throat> this is one of the first ones that was called the Southern Alliance, and it was formed in Texas. The greatest enemy of the branch was the railroads. So, we've seen this. The last one you see. Okay, let's do this. Sorry, guys. Had a little glitch there. So now it's the Grange against the railroads. And of course, the railroads are very, very powerful. This, remember, these were the first big corporations. And the, the railroads, they can charge anything they want, and the farmers. They're going to pass some laws at the state level, but um, the Granger laws are going to. Remember, railroads are interstate. So even though they got some state laws passed, um, the railroads basically were saying, hey, you don't even have to, to pay attention to those. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just not stop at your farm. We'll not stop and pick up your, your stuff at your mill. And they had the leverage. The, they're going to go to the government for help. And the government, remember, laissez-faire. So the government is laissez-faire, and they are not helping so the railroads are going to temporarily win this battle. In 1887, uh, again, this is at the federal level, the Interstate Commerce Act is passed. And along with the Hepburn Act, this is supposed to protect farmers and people. 
uh, it says railroads and this is applying now to like FedEx and UPS and anything that's shipped by sea or land or air and this is still in effect. Rates have to be reasonable. You, you'd be able to go online right now if you've got a package to, to ship. It's got to be published. You'd be able to find out how much that's going to cost you. They have to give any kind of a uh, notice if they're going to change the rates and they have to get approval from the government to raise rates because they file an annual report with the government. Okay, I'm going to post the Interstate well. Commerce Act of 1887. In 1887, American society was expanding. Interstate commerce, shipping goods between states, became more commonplace. Grover Cleveland was serving his first term as President of the United States, and the farm had become a mainstay of the economy. Farms of all descriptions had become established from coast to coast. The shipment of farm products by rail became routine. The Interstate Commerce Act is designed to govern railroads. And remember that railroads are a kind of natural monopoly. It doesn't make any sense for Railroad Company A to put up a railroad right next to that, the track of Railroad Company B. So that meant that each railroad, to a great extent, had a regional monopoly, which meant that they could charge monopoly prices and they could squeeze the farmers who were the source of the commodities that the railroads were moving. The family farm had become a foundation of American society. But in the late 19th century, many farmers were in serious financial trouble. As farm production grew, prices fell. The cost of farm equipment continued to rise. Banks were charging more interest on farm loans. And railway companies were asking for higher rates to get farmers' goods to market. Many farmers couldn't make it and lost their farms to foreclosure. Farmers began organizing in an effort to fix their problems. The National Grange, the first major farmers organization, established cooperatives and pushed for legislation that would help farmers. One of the National Grange's primary movements was to force states to regulate railroad freight and grain storage rates. The Interstate Commerce Act was passed by Congress in 1887. It prohibited railroads from giving secret rebates or refunds to large shippers. They could not charge more for short hauls than long hauls over the same route. The act created the Interstate Commerce Commission. The act, with its provision for the five-man Interstate Commerce Commission, remains one of America's most important documents, serving as a model for future government regulation of private business. So the farmers are in trouble, like we said, about 50% are going to be losing. And in addition to that, we're going to have inflation, uh, increase in prices, and deflation. <laughs> remember, remember the uh, business cycle we talked about, up, down, up, down. Farmers and people don't know what their money is worth. And when you think of uh, inflation and deflation, just think about a balloon. When it's inflated, prices are going up. When it's deflated, prices are going down. So we end up with the Panic of 1893. Uh, this is another member, again, business cycles, up, down, up, down, up, down. Some of the railroads actually uh, uh, lost their business and, and uh, went into bankruptcy. The stock market crashed. There was a huge, huge agricultural depression and high unemployment, 14, 15, 16 percent. Gold reserves were low, so they could not print additional money because we were on a gold reserve system. So what is the answer? Well, the farmers come up with it. We need more money. In Let's use silver. Okay, remember we had the Comstock load in Virginia City, Nevada. So what they did want to do is not eliminate gold, but add silver to our money supply. Therefore, they could print more money, there would be more money in the system. And so this is going to become a huge, huge issue, and it's called the buy to metallic system. And this is going to be an issue with the Populist Party, a brand new party in the 1890s. 
So this is an example of a gold certificate. Uh, they stopped making those now. If you look at your money today, it's called fiat money. And basically that just means as long as the, your government is good, your money is good. But back in the day, all paper money had to be backed by gold. And this is, uh, if you have one of these, it's worth a lot of money. Okay, this is uh, another example. It's a $10 gold certificate. If you have that, it's worth about $725. It might be more because this is kind of an old slide. This money supply situation. And they come up with that silver idea, and it's going to be embraced, and people are going to say, idea. So the Greenback Party, remember Greenbacks are money, uh, their idea was let's give $50 to every citizen in the United States. And that might sound silly, but just think about uh, COVID. They sent money to everybody. I mean, that's sometimes a way that uh, governments will use to stimulate the economy. So this was their idea, $50 to every citizen, and print more money and back it with silver. The farmers think this is a great idea. The factory workers think this is a great idea. The Greenback Party disappears, and it's going to become the Populist Party. So the Populist Party is born on July 4th, 1892 in St. Louis, Missouri, and they're going to adapt not only this money idea, but uh, several other ideas like an income tax and eight-hour days and radical, radical ideas that are commonplace today. So this is, this is some of their, their ideas. It's going to be a major political third party. Uh, they're strong factory workers, farmers, this is the majority of our population. So their issues, money, fix the railroads, let's nationalize them, let's put them under the control of the government. And then uh, for the working people, let's recognize unions and uh, improve working conditions. So this is uh, kind of showing people being drawn to the flame. And this is, um, you know, Coming to the plane and these, these politicians are destroying themselves because remember that we have these corrupt political agendas and this is a political cartoon uh, kind of criticizing how, how the government is handling things. So this is called the Free Silver Movement of the Bipetalic Standard and this is really important because it's going to be a political statement. Remember we talked about March, and we're, you're probably aware, I mean, we always talk about Martin Luther King and the March on Washington. Well, Cox's Army is the first formal March on Washington. Cox's Army is in 1894, Cox's Army, and he is a, um, he had been in the, in the uh, service, that's why they call him that, but he is wanting the government to do something about jobs and unemployment, and he starts in Ohio and it grows and grows. And um, if you get that many people washing to, marching to Washington, D.C., people tend to pay attention. So know that this is the first march on Washington, led by General Jacob Coxey, and um, he is protesting, and people are going to pay attention to this march. Populist Party is gonna grow. So here he is, I love this picture. Uh, Christopher Columbus Jones, is that a great name? And then you've got uh, Jacob Coxey here on the right and his, his uh, second in command, Carl Brown. And this is a nationwide press, it's got a lot of press. 